Hello. It's often said that the best defense is a good offense. It's less often said that the best offense is a good defense, but there I said it. Today, we'll explore whether this oft less touted belief, championed only by a few wild unknown men, bears any validity by conscripting a large army in Mountain Blade Banner Lord, where everyone has a shield. That means no archers, no cavalry, no nothing else. Just shield-bearing normies. I set out to see if I could create a viable shield wall army in Bannerlord. And here's what happened. The first step was to create an avatar. Small boy is easy to knock down, so I chose a big, thick man for my character and gave him the only acceptable name for such a large hunk of meat. Shield Sheafson, King of the Spear Danes. For our crest, just a picture of a brick wall. One is the loneliest number, and every quest starts in Bannerlord up from the bootstraps. We started off in the Empire and hired the first few farmhands available for recruitment. They didn't have shields, and they most certainly weren't a wall, but they had torsos, which were the next most convincing thing. So I hired 19 and started chasing down some bandits. This proved to be an excellent test. The bandits' aggressive rock throwing turned out to be the perfect interview to see who would pass as part of the shield wall, to withstand waves of stones with without buckling and falling over. Who could withstand being stabbed directly in the chest in the name of no particular cause, duty, or nation, besides blindly working for a paycheck of gold doubloons? Only the thickest, both literally and figuratively, among that group survived the preliminary trials of stabbings and maulings. When entering the fray of combat against other poor people without jobs, I stood behind the company and performed my duties of shouting at my men, continue standing there while the ones around them were being knocked unconscious. For all those that were weeded out, I did manage to find a few keepers, genetic freaks who were able to withstand multiple stabbings, maulings, bludgeonings, and being knocked unconscious, who were willing to remain in my employ. No longer were they limited to using their chests to defend me, but instead they were hired full-time and received actual shields. I finally had it, a shield wall. Now the real fun could begin. Lots of people died. The guilt was enormous, but we had to keep going on somehow. To get a shield wall, we'd need money. And to get money, we'd need to take human lives. This turns out to be one of the most lucrative enterprises in Bannerlord. You can somehow break even by making peasants fight each other. And as we did so, our warband grew more well-equipped. We reached those early phases of the shield wall. As a result of competing in so many tournaments, now both my men and I were well-equipped, ready to deter the unwashed masses. As a result of our training, casualties lowered in battle. Only one or two men died per fight because they were so well-equipped and those that survived were able to be upgraded into Imperial Legionaries, metal-clad chads of great girth and disturbing countenance. We fought in the desert, we fought in the snow, we fought in the grass, and it seemed like everything was going just fine. It was the perfect opportunity to recruit Asmon Gold, or at least this guy who looks like him. It was the perfect defense from any threat or adversity. Physical men to protect me from physical attacks, and a partnership from a lookalike of one of Twitch's most popular streamers, Amnon. Close enough, he would do. I purchased his aid for 442 gold doubloons. And then I beat the living daylights out of several innocent men. I really kicked the candy out of those people. This was enough to find the right gear and assert dominance over my manly, strong army. We had reached our size limit as an independent warband. They say it's not about the size of your shield, but the size of your heart. Still, large shield and large heart. Our warband's size ceiling was capped at a measly 50 men. I didn't want a shield squad, I wanted a shield wall. Wall means, wall means a lot. The next evolution of our melee machine meant going corporate. His name was Emperor Garios, and he had the Chad looks and the oily sheen of an adult film star. Emperor of the Western Empire, my only option was to ally with this man in order to secure a good, strong show of shield-bearing men, for there were many such men in his realm available for my employ. I pledged my vassalage and began my subversive campaign. This of course meant that the colors of our crest changed in conformity with this absolute alpha chad of a man, but it also meant that we were learning from the best and getting to take part in those grand-scale pitch battles every Bannerlord player lusts after. No feeling is more intensely satisfying than the rising of numbers. 
watching a simulation of thousands of men throw their lives away at fully realizing your outstandingly dumb strategy. There's nothing like being able to participate in grim, spectacular medieval warfare, knowing that you'll be reincarnated afterward and suffer no physical consequences. I turned my focus from fighting in combat to commanding and observing the shield wall to assess its effectiveness. It was indeed very effective. As we grew in loyalty, we started participating in castle sieges to show that we were a real team player, willing to lend a few men to Emperor Garios's bulbous, imperialistic campaigns. All the while, my army's size cap grew, and so with it troop veterancy, making my unwashed masses of peasants into a solid chrome threat, gliding across fields like death incarnate. These men were fearless, and could take more than an arrow to the knee. As displayed by the javelins, we leapt in our shields one combat after another to intimidate our foes. We were granted a castle, opening new possibilities at management, necessitating the hiring of yet more experienced troops, and officially leaving behind the peasants we relied upon for our original source of meat shieldery. Although it left them unemployed, the rest we trained up to Imperial Legionary status, and recruits, once they ranked up in veterancy, enjoyed a long tenure in our company. This all gave us greater sway in our voice on Imperial affairs. We could choose our wars and rock the vote to fight our most advantageous battles. We were no small fish in this pond anymore. Square formation. That is to say, our strength and versatility grew both bureaucratically and strategically. We experimented with alternate formations, Square, circle, spread, shield wall. Spread out! And hardly a single man suffered a scratch, even when great hordes of foes washed upon our lines like water on a rock. At this point in time, I'll admit that some of the limitations of commanding only a shield wall come to light. We lacked mobility and range, but we more than made up for that in endurance and sheer brute force. Few tactics inspire greater dread than the slow crawl of armored foot soldiers. The whole experience felt akin to commanding a giant boulder, slow, hard, and indestructible but awesome in its power. For however long it took us to chase down the enemy, it was a grim scene wherever we got a hold of them in battle. Through our growth and influence, we acquired more castles, grew a larger army, and participated in the ever-widening front of the Western Empire's baffling crusade for more land. And there's no better feeling than rushing your army of elite vanguards into a large, juicy throng of looters, saddled with bounty, that will feed you and pay your oversized clan for weeks at a time. So is the path in Bannerlord from ordinary foot soldier to commander and warlord, able to influence the outcome of events more as a tactician than a warrior. Like watching a snowball that you rolled down a mountain with a light tap evolve into an avalanche. I was a cruel commander too. Whenever my men insisted on celebration, I would order them back into line and batter them with blows from a two-handed sword or hurl javelins directly point-blank into their ribs in order to remind them that they were human and made of the same flesh as their enemies, but they possessed an indomitable will. Tis but a scratch, my lord. Tis a butt scratch. Thus our warband began just swallowing people up. We were corporate America, too big to fail in our own right. Power was abused, arrows were taken to the knees, destroying entire careers. Doo-doo was flung. This was the story of our rise. Happy times were upon us. Mars, the god of war, marched into battle alongside us. Vulcan, god of the forge, blessed our intrepid warrior's armor with impenetrable toughness. That is to say, Bannerlord is a lot more fun when you actually make use of the formations which are most meaningful in the sway of battle when it comes to the core of our army. Those ordinary foot soldiers whose effectiveness could be multiplied a hundredfold by the skillful execution of a genius tactician, or fall flat when left to the devices of a moron. Prior to this recording, I had been espoused to the illusion that archery was the best way to play the game, since it gave your opponent no opportunity to approach you on the battlefield. Not true when a turtle formation of shield-bearing chads are descending upon you to poop in your cereal. So our campaign evolved and progressed, ultimately aimed at claiming our own city where we would find peace and prosperity. The goal of any Bannerlord playthrough, settle down, start a household, and don a toga so that you can spend the last of your days philosophizing behind a thick, comfortable wall through which no adversary can penetrate. So we sent our aid to the siege of Poros in the Southern Empire, visions of togas dancing through our heads. Those most salient soldiers up the ladder gave their lives securing a foothold for the rest of us to sweep the peasants defending the battlements. Big-chinned Emperor Garios, chattest of chads, was pleased with our performance in battle. Unfortunately, we were not granted rule of the city, but I remained calm and focused. Never mind that, we continued on our conquests, having lost some of our finest soldiers, but still flooded with more riches than we could ever carry on our backs. No matter, 
we'd come back with a little more peasant punishment. The battle was bloody as ever, but horribly one-sided. That was enough money and loot to finance the next major war, when Emperor Garios made the largest hosts I've ever seen in this entire game. 2,000 men in a single army. We joined the great host for the exciting siege of Kiaz. And though other commanders' archers got physically smacked, our turtleish warriors marched with the patience of Joshua at Jericho. As we marched up and planted our siege towers, we stormed those walls, and one by one those last sections of battlements fell, and the city was ours for the taking. For like a Trojan horse, we are slow and sturdy on the outside, never revealing our true power. But once we get into your city, hold on to your hat. With the assault finished, the city was in friendly hands, and I joined the tournament to take a look at our winnings. Hither to that day I had been shield chiefson, but they might as well have called me Liam, Arrow to the Neeson, a far better moniker for the legacy I left there. And to my great surprise, Emperor Garius, to his council's opposition, granted the city to me, bearer of the shield wall, now at long last with a real wall to call my own. An exciting day. I had reign over almost as many settlements as Garios himself, and I had fully ascended the ladder to imperial trust. Attending those elite circles, it took great pains to defend that city, but we were now a solid core able to whittle our army back down to just those most elite warriors and garrison the rest in our cities. A warband made up only of the strongest. A dream finally realized. Now to put my final question to the test. In a perfect world, could this tactical configuration stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against all horses, all bowmen? Battle number one. 1,000 man shield wall versus 1,000 novice bowmen. The winner? Shield wall. No contest here. The archers seem to have no idea what to do as a wave of death descends upon them, to which they have no reasonable answer or counterattack. Shield boys walk up, arms raised, then swoop in for the attack, once in range of close combat. Battle number two, 1000 man shield wall versus veteran bowmen. The winner? No contest again. Exactly the same thing as before. Battle number three, Shield wall versus elite horse pikemen. A far more interesting fight, and one in which the shield wall at first appears to struggle, but ultimately demonstrates profound resilience, like a crab sidling around an errant swimmer's foot, pinching and letting blood bit by bit. Surprisingly, even without pikes, the shield wall wins again due to its inability to ever be meaningfully penetrated or broken up by the horsemen. Battle number four. Shield wall versus mounted archers. I don't want to say that they didn't win, but they didn't win. Never fast enough, the shield wall is like an object being orbited in space, but the two objects never touch. Warriors die from being shot by flanking arrows. Perhaps the only flaw of the shield wall, then, is its lack of speed. But it's a very specific situation indeed. This is one of the only ways it can be countered, by a massive host of mounted archers in a completely open field. Not realistic at all. That is to say, you could have your own shield wall too, for the right price, and given enough cultivation into training your valuable foot soldiers. And that's why Bannerlord is very fun. As always, I'm Ambiguous Amphibian. A major thanks to my patrons, who unfortunately took an arrow to the knee in the filming of this video. I hope you enjoyed. Until we meet again.